if you would like to give us a little uh, 10, 10, 15 minutes about what you guys are up to. Um, and uh, and then we'll call, call it a close. Aaron, over to you. Cool. Sounds, sounds great. Dom, can you hear me all right? Yeah, just perfectly. Okay, wonderful. Let me share my screen. Uh, and again, as we discussed, I was just going to share some of the slides that I presented at the, uh, the second annual uh, Greening of Streaming Summit uh, just before IBC. Um, so just a bit of background on me for those of you that I've, I've not met before. Uh, I'm Aaron Beeman, and um, I'm Global Lead of Media and Entertainment now at AMD. Um, I've spent the last 14 years or so across a couple of stints at Xilinx, um, first focused on uh, the sell-in of FPGAs and adaptable SOCs into the broadcast equipment space. So uh, a good portion of the gear that you might find in an OBV or within a broadcast plant uh, is, is largely powered by uh, Xilinx FPGAs and products. Um, from there, uh, when I returned to Xilinx, I actually joined the data center group where I was specifically focused on live transcoding workloads. So uh, Xilinx had, uh, still has a good decade long relationship with Twitch. And a lot of what I'll talk about today is around what we've done on the FPGA side or the adaptable SOC side of the business with regard to how we support uh, live streaming platforms like Twitch, because those certainly are, are, are computationally very intensive. You've got to make sure you've got all of the right compute lined up to support the immediacy of a live platform. Uh, whereas file-based video on demand, um, you know, you've got a new series that's coming out for Netflix. Uh, they purchased a tremendous amount of AWS credit and they would just kind of schedule that across fallow resources and take as long as they really need to, to uh, pristinely encode that content. It's the live platforms we believe at, at Xilinx and now AMD where you know, there's really a lot of implications around power consumption. Uh, after the acquisition of AMD, I actually moved over. Uh, and so I'm now part of the server business unit. So I'm representing the Epic CPUs. I'll talk a little bit about those, those CPUs, but they're super dense, uh, high core count CPUs that are being used in a lot of uh, transcoding and, and CDN use cases, as well as also being uh, used on content creation use cases, such as uh, rendering um, and virtual production and a whole slew of other uh, interesting applications at the front end of creating all of that content. So, and, and please stop me uh, as you as you wish during this uh, this presentation if you have any any questions. But um, this has been a model or a paradigm that that we've adopted. Uh, this first initially appeared in a technical blog that Twitch uh, posted many years ago. But we feel that this is really timeless and a good representation of the dynamic that occurs within a live streaming platform. Um, essentially, uh, you've got this large democratizing platform that needs to support a whole slew of broadcasters, some of which may only have a couple of subscribers watching their streams, but then others that are just consuming a tremendous amount of uh, viewership. Uh, and these statistics are, are interestingly um, all you know, publicly available and uh, published in somewhat real time on twitchstatistics.com. Um, I've got a link to that here. Uh, as of the Greening of Streaming Summit, I think at the time, at that moment, there was something on the order of 97,000 live broadcasters on that platform alone. Um, <clears throat> and essentially what we're representing here in this diagram is the Pareto's principle at play. Um, you have essentially hundreds of streamers on that platform that are commanding probably 80 plus percent of the, of the viewership. And so here, it's really, really all about making sure that you're pristinely uh, encoding this content, um, and doing whatever you can to manage your OPEX, right? Because Twitch, uh, now owned by AWS, still has to pay bills for all of the egress of the data out of its data center. And so putting focus on this kind of front end of the curve on optimizing around OPEX uh, is really important. And it's, it's really, it's here where I, I would say AMD CPUs or, or software-based approaches to transcoding are, are really being applied here. Um, but then what do you do with this long tail, right? This long tail is a massive problem for these platforms uh, and they really need to look to optimize um, for, for CapEx, right? So deploying the infrastructure in the most 
possibly cost effective way that you can. And so this is an area where I've spent the last three or so years of my career focused on building products and solutions to go off and address uh, the CapEx problem. Um, and, and with that, um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about some of the silicon solutions that, that AMD represents on, on both ends of this, this coin, if you will. So taking a look first on what would AMD would use to address that left end of that of that that paradigm or that or that model uh, would be our Epic CPUs. So the Epic CPUs, um, which were first introduced in 2017, um, and we're now on our third iteration or generation of that technology. Um, actually, November of this year, uh, we'll be launching our, our fourth generation. And it was about a week or so ago that on the client side, on the, you know, the, the, the CPUs that go into laptops and desktops, et cetera, we announced the new Ryzen um, uh, CPUs, the 7000 series. Those are based off of the same microarchitecture, the Zen 4 microarchitecture, which will make its way into the uh, server uh, CPUs. Um, and essentially what we are continuing to drive for here at AMD is just a more and more density of cores uh, in a similar amount of silicon, right? And this is super important because this is just allowing us all to be a lot more efficient. So uh, an Epic CPU, I think, consumes anywhere from 225 watts to 280 watts. Today, our most um, you know, performant um, uh, CPU can support up to 64 cores. The ones that we'll be launching in the November timeframe will have support for 96 cores. And then about a year out from there, um, 128 cores. So AMD is just on this relentless pursuit of cramming more and more compute capability into the same amount of silicon uh, um, you know, space as you possibly can, right? Giving you, um, yep. Sorry, can I interrupt? Does, does, has the power yeah. remained, has the power remained consistent as you've it, added it, 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 those more cores? It, 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 it does. And that 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 um, is, is largely a benefit of us moving from the seven nanometer uh, process node that we're on with at, at TSMC to five nanometer. So uh, that'll be a five nanometer uh, device um, as, as is, I mean, most of this is, 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 you know, publicly, um, you know, available. I'm not making any, any large, you know, proprietary uh, disclosures at this point. Um, but yes, um, because of that advancement in process node and the ability to cram more transistors into silicon, that's giving us the ability to get more of these um, Zen 4 microarchitectures uh, into, uh, into the chip. Yes, we're, we're able to, to hold power um, at, a, at a relatively constant rate. Um, so clearly, um, encoding is one of those workloads that just really um, can exploit, um, you know, multi-threaded um, approaches. Um, and so as core scale, um, that means number of channels um, uh, emanating out of a single piece of silicon can, can scale as well. Uh, additionally, um, you know, many of the, our, our partners, our ISV partners, um, our, their license models are, are per node. So as these cores uh, <laughs> that may, you know, that may cause some of them, and, and I'm, I'm sure that they are look, to look at, at, at revisiting business models, but there's certainly a TCO uh, advantage here because not only is it the silicon, but of course, it's the wonderful algorithms that are developed from our partners like, like Cinemedia and Atem, right? All of whom are uh, members here as well. Um, faster PCIe bandwidth. So we continue to support uh, greater bandwidth, which allows us to support bigger, better, faster pixels, right? Um, uh, to, to enable um, this 8K ecosystem as we were discussing with Cinemedia at IBC. Um, in fact, this next generation of Epic CPUs from AMD will have support now for PCIe 5 and DDR5. Um, and then faster memory. Um, so faster CPU cache memory, uh, subsystem transfers, um, and enhanced uh, cache per core advantages. So just taking a look at a benchmark on X264 at 4K, uh, and this is public information. This is from openbenchmarking.org. Um, so uh, if you've got a piece of kit in your data center on your desk, you can run these benchmarks and um, you can see the number of, um, of results that are produced. The, the, the red um, font on this chart represent the AMD-based products. And you can see that Epic really 
is is ruling uh, in terms of its strength just because of this this massive core density. So being able to spread X264 across all of those cores um, is enabling uh, real-time use cases at 4K. Um, and we hold the, the top five positions, at least as of the time that I ran this back on September 6th uh, before, uh, before IBC. Um, in addition to this, um, you know, we work closely, you know, Sam with, 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 with Guido and PD and the team and Finova, LCEVC is a, is a fantastic um, approach. And in fact, I'd love to talk to you um, from the discussion we had earlier today in the session around how AMD can get more involved there. So I can follow up with you, you know, don't, don't hesitate to reach out to me. But that's something that's very interesting uh, to, to us as well. I think LCEVC, just because of AVC's um, uh, you know, critical mass and, and, and large install base, I think offers you know, tremendous advantages. What I'm representing here, though, are other emerging encoding standards that are really focused on continuing to drive um, bit rates down while preserving uh, video quality at the same level. And of course, one of those is what the AOM, the Alliance for Open Media, has been doing in the area of AV1. Vigenular, um, headed up by Zoe Liu, uh, again, a partner of ours, uh, she hails from, from, from Google, uh, has its Aurora One uh, encoder. And this is just a comparison of Aurora One versus Intel's implementation of LibAOM, which is SVTAV1. And this is running on our, our biggest 64 core current generation Epic CPU versus one of the biggest, baddest Intel uh, Xeon uh, CPUs out there. And this is running low, live uh, 4K content just to show, again, it's that core density that is really giving AMD, um, I think, some tremendous advantages in the market um, with regard to uh, getting the most out of a single piece of silicon relative to anything else under the sun. Um, so we're 96% faster on Epic relative to Intel, 7.2 times faster than SVTAV1 running on uh, this, this AMD Epic 7763 device, uh, and 6.4 times faster um, than the Intel Xeon. Um, this is four concurrent 4KP60 live streams uh, encoded on a single AMD EPIC uh, processor. Uh, this is taken just from uh, Visionular's public uh, information on their website, and I've provided a link down here as well. So that speaks to that kind of front end where we want to optimize operating expenses. Um, we're, we know we're going to get a ton of great viewership. Uh, on a few streams, but we want to minimize the egress costs and, of course, minimize the, the carbon uh, footprint of those, those streams. How you then handle these democratizing platforms and then produce um, infrastructure that can support this long tail of streamers, uh, this has been the Xilinx approach, and, and this is the current generation product. We have a, a subsequent generation of this product that will be coming out. <clears throat> uh, and this is a, a height. Uh, density media processing platform. It's called the Alveo U30. So this is a half height, half length card that can fit into any server um, that, that's, that's produced just because of the form factor. This is a very small form factor. And it contains two adaptable SOCs from, from Xilinx uh, that actually have hardened the, um, the encoding algorithms, so AVC and HEVC in particular, into the silicon, right? These algorithms are extremely uh, computationally intense. Uh, if they were to be implemented in an FPGA, they would be enormous and they would not be as power efficient. So think of this as a small ASIC region within uh, what is a programmable uh, SOC, meaning that you've got the FPGA fabric there. And one of the things that we've done here is we've implemented the adaptive bitrate um, scaler uh, to support the ABR use case. And what that means is, is that uh, if you had just an encoder in silicon and you had to do the uh, adaptive bitrate scaling in software, you would have to send you know, the signals back and forth from the encoder to the CPU. And by virtue of us um, hardening, uh, rather or hardening this in, in essence through the FPGA fabric, uh, it allows us to completely offload all of that from the CPU. So it gives the CPU other things that it can, can do and focus on like ad insertion or um, you know, other, other use cases. This platform can support up to two channels of 4KP60 throughput. 
at 25 watts. So it really does offer um, a tremendous advantage in the market um, in terms of uh, what it consumes in order to produce um, this massive number of, of streams. Now, we have to make some, some trade-offs, of course. So the video quality here is not gonna be as tunable um, as, as what you might be able to implement in software. So this would be essentially the equivalent of X264 and X265 faster. Um, there's a full-fledged SDK. Uh, I've got a link in here to it, uh, which um, uh, AMD uh, Xilinx have developed. Um, and then of course we work closely with Twitch as well as worked closely with the EC2 team over at AWS. So these cards are actually stood up as the VT1 instances and um, Theo uh, Player, their Theo Live product uh, is, is built on, on top of uh, those, those VT1 instances. So we already have this being used not only by Twitch, uh, but also by other companies uh, that are rapidly adopting uh, this, this hardware-based approach to transcoding, which, which is, is very um, um, energy, energy efficient. So with that, I'm just, uh, last slide here, Dom, just overlaying what I've already verbalized uh, in the session, which is the AMD Epic uh, CPUs are, are largely focused on the front end of this, this model here. And then we have the Alveo U30s uh, positioned on that long tail. Um, I've done some, some basic calculation around what the watt per stream is. We normalize to a 1080p60 stream uh, when talking about streams at AMD. Um, and as I'd mentioned, both products um, will have um, new next generation solutions in market. Uh, on the CPU side, uh, announcements will officially be happening in the November timeframe. And then next year, we'll be launching um, a successor to the Alveo U30, uh, which will be a pure ASIC uh, solution uh, that will now approach supporting 8K uh, P30 workloads. So. That, I think that covers what I wanted to, to share with the with the team today. That's awesome, Aaron. Thank you so much for that. Uh, really appreciate it. Um, just a, a quick uh, uh, upfront request. I wondered if when you're next running any benchmark tests like that, um, basically everything was looking at fully loading things within the 25 watt um, capacity, certainly in that second, uh, the, the transcoding card, uh, the, the loading everything up to 25 watt. I'd be really interested to see how that power varies as you have, uh, you know, partially loaded platform I see. And, and whether it's just staying at 25 watts. So if you're running just one stream through it, that yep. thing, that, that, that has a different profile. Mode. Absolutely, I don't know if that's shared by other. Yeah, I'll, I'll make a query. I'll make a query into the. I think. Team, I'll make a yeah, just to just to fix fix the uh, fix the streaming quality and vary the oh. vary the quantities to see how the power varies because within this group i'm usually perhaps we're 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 we are all concerned about energy uh and that's that that's a kpi for us so Great. i have a yeah, feeling me... there's probably a number of other people who want to reach for the mute button and, and ask questions <laughs> um if there is raise your hand uh, yeah let's, uh, let's have a raise of hands if you've got any questions for Aaron. Uh, yeah. i have a question Go for Arnold. For, yeah um you talk about the abr uh, later <clears throat> i'm sorry Mm -hmm. How does it uh, work exactly, um, especially on the A6 side? Do you have like a card that can produce eight different bit rates at different resolution? And what is the added cost of you know um, those uh, different bit rates at different resolution in terms of energy? Is it something that you can get, you know, and information you can read? Like um, I have, I want to do four a different resolution. And what the cost of going for eight or sixteen? Because I saw that um, Amazon, when they were streaming, you know, the NFL, uh, they are having an incredible letter of encoding with I think twenty four different yes. bit rates. Uh, so, is there a way to know um, how much energy uh, we're gonna gain if we uh, reduce, or how much more energy is gonna cost if we add more? Um, bit rate more resolution and is it something that your card can do uh, like mm -hmm. you know speed um, eight different resolution to the world yep. di di directly from the ASIC? so so yeah so so actually um as as i recall because I've, I've transitioned into a, a different role now but <laughs> i looked after this for several years um the abr ladder um was implemented 
um, as, as a kernel, right? As a piece of hardware, like think of it like an ASIC. It was implemented in FPGA gates and hardened, right? And, and we don't adapt that, we make that available um, and accessible through an API. So within that API, you can uh, designate the number of resolutions that you want to support. I believe it, we support up to eight. The SDK, um, and, and Dom, I can share the slides right after this. I, I may have already. Um, and if you want to post those for, for others to look at, um, I've got links to the SDK. Um, and we provide the various renditions um, or ABR ladders that we support. So if you were to only run four, um, I, I need to, it's, it's actually very much aligned with the, the request that Dom had. I'm gonna consult my engineering team and understand a couple of things. Number one, um, how does the power vary if you're running just a single, mm -hmm. let's say 720p stream um, on the card and nothing else? And then also how does the power vary if you're fully saturating the ABR ladder as it's instantiated in the FPGA region of the, of the device? Or you know, does it does it go down if you're only you know streaming uh, maybe half the the, the rendition? So um, I don't know. I'm 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 happy to uh, investigate that, and I can follow up with with Dom yeah. or you know let me know best how to follow up to these questions. Yeah. I, I certainly I, can. ideally on the um, ideally on the members at uh, greeningofstreaming.org mailing list so that we can all follow the conversations. Okay. I, yeah. I, I, uh, I, I'd rather we. I'd rather that email got overloaded than people ask me to put them in digest mode. Uh, and yeah, yeah, yeah. That's fine. Having to work out how yeah, to do that stuff too. That'd be good. Yeah, I'll reach out to you and make sure I have it. But yeah, I'll go and I, I apologize. I, I do need to 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 move to a, another call. But okay. I'm happy happy to um, happy to um, uh, follow up with those those two questions. And I guess I'll I'll wait. Yeah. I can wait another. Yeah, Alec, I, I noticed Alexander had his hand up as well. But if you've got to go, Aaron. That, that, that's cool. Uh, really I, I can it. take. I'll, yeah, I can take. Well, I'll take. I can be a couple minutes late. It's all right. Okay. So, Alex, yeah, just yeah. just one quick question. So you mentioned that for the first uh, for the for the hundreds of streams you're going for, to use CPU, and for the rest you're using the the ASIC based solution. So where is the trade off? So so why not use the ASICs for everything just because of scalability? Because you have so many peaks, and so it's it's more difficult. Video video quality video quality. If you're if you're watching Ninja on the Twitch platform, you'd better make sure that that is pristinely encoded. So it really, it, the trade-off comes down to VQ, right? If you're going past a, let's let's kind of correlate the, the ASIC platform to uh, X265, X264 faster. If you need, you know, medium, um, we, we can't achieve that. Um, future iterations of that, that product will improve video quality along with resolutions and, and other vectors. Uh, but yeah, software really offers up kind of that, that best possible video quality. Okay, got it, cool. And the second question was, you, I think you mentioned a program that Sona Media and Atem are members of. So, so what, what kind of program is that? On? I was talking about this, this program, the streaming, uh, the, the greening of streaming. Oh, okay, okay, got it. Uh, yeah, our, our, our participants Cine along with. Just, just to be clear, Sona Media are creeping in through the back door by acquiring Cortex, who are members. <laughs> All right. Well, if I can help, uh, a way to right join. Now, <laughs> well, there, Dom, there. that's that's sort of like I pushed Aaron and Sean a year and a half ago to join as Xilinx, and now they've joined as AMD. So it's a nice problem work. to have. Thanks, Barbara. Great, great to see you. Right. I see people saying cheerio in the chat room. Yeah. We've we've Thank we've you. hit the hour. Really appreciate Aaron. Much appreciated sure. for, for our green stream for the month.